university on this. I also do research. Uh, I give grants to different types of drugs and look at uh, the effects on the drugs. So um, I'm just going to start out with a couple of things that um, I've uh, noticed is most people, right, when, so I teach at also at a Christian university. So one of the things um, that I've noticed at uh, the Christian university that uh, I teach at is people actually have a hard time understanding that addiction is a brain disease. And oftentimes, maybe because it's, I teach at a Pentecostal school, one of the things that I oftentimes see is a huge problem is people address it as purely a spiritual disease. And, and to me, addiction is a disease of the brain, the spirit and of the body, it's all three. And if you dress only one, you're not gonna solve the issue, right? So that's that's one main thing that I think I'm going to try to just really hit on, uh, really hit on, is that addiction, whether behavioral is, right, um, is a disease. Now, sometimes people have a hard time with that. They say, well, where's the role of the person? Yes, the person, when they first started doing the drug, that was their choice. Right? They made those bad decisions, right? But once you really get into the full-blown addiction, right, um, it truly does change you. And oftentimes, for example, oftentimes I tell people, one of the worst things that you can tell someone that is an addict is stop. Just stop, right? And oftentimes I tell people, for example, let's say I've had a, um, and this is partially true, I, eat a lot of junk food, right? And because I've eaten a lot of junk food, food, right now I have a heart condition. My heart is now messed up. Because now I have a messed up heart, one of the symptoms is that I have high blood pressure. Good? Now let's say David has high blood pressure because of that. And I go to David, how dare you have high blood pressure? Lower your blood pressure. We all laugh at that, right? Kind of say that's stupid. It's, but we actually oftentimes do the same thing with drug addiction, right? We say, how dare you do drugs? Just stop. stop. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. Instead of the heart being affected, it's the brain. The drugs have affected the brain to a certain degree. So that's, that is a choice. Uh, sorry, that is a disease, right? This is a complete myth, right? Um, how about this one, right? I t uh, I'm sorry, more involved in interaction. More people die from addiction to heroin, cocaine, and amphetamine than alcohol. That one's a myth. Actually, more people die of tobacco and alcohol than cocaine. Now think about that. It's the legal ones that are mm. killing the most people. Mm. Don't do something about marijuana, <coughs> right? Okay. Um, right? So legality has nothing to do with whether it's safe or not, like David said, okay? Um, here's another one. For drug addicts, the rush and the feeling of the euphoria is the main push that induces them. The, the real reason that people do drugs is because they want that high. You guys think that's a truth or that's a myth? That most people really do drugs because they want that high. Not the addict. Was that? Addict, no. Not the addict, exactly. Maybe that's what initially got them to do it because they like the high, right? But actually for most people, right, because their brain has changed in such a way they actually now do the drug just to function, just to feel normal, right? Um, here's some, some right, uh, quotes, right? 34, uh, here's a 34-year-old recovering meth user. When I first started, I remember having a huge reaction to a small amount of speed, right, that's cocaine. Um, inside of a year, I could shoot up a spoon of it easily, which is a pretty fair amount, and it finally got to the point where I couldn't even sleep until I've done so. Here's a 36-year-old recovering heroin user. When we were really strong out on heroin, we were spending $150 to $200 uh, dollars a day to feel normal. It's one thing to spend that kind of money and get loaded, but when you're spending that kind of money just to function as a human being, it's irritating. Right? Most addicts will tell you, I know that the drug is bad. I know that the drug is messing up my life. You don't need to tell them that. <laughs> they actually already know that. 
But the problem is with addiction, right? Once you've got into a certain point, your body has changed so that you actually need the drug to function. Right? And this is part of the, the therapies, how to go ahead and get them off of it, right? Um, because a lot of times, they'll tell you, I want to be off the drug. They don't like it, right? But they need it in order to right, function, okay? Here's another one. Um, a drug addict, for example, al uh, an alcoholic can die as a result from not taking the drug. It's true. This one is true. It depends on the drug, not all drugs. So, for example, uh, cocaine, meth, you're not going to actually die from the, uh, the withdrawal effect. If you're a true, bro uh, true blown alcoholic, you can actually die from not having alcohol in your system. And the funny thing is, uh, and David mentioned this, actually prescription drugs, the withdrawal effects can kill you. Right. So, um, right. so this one's actually a fact. Another thing to kind of keep in mind, when you think of people who overdose on drugs, right, where do they tend to overdose? What was that? On their own. On their own? Okay, so by themselves, okay. Yeah. But where? Physically, give me locations. Hotels. What was that? Hotels. Hotels. Gas stations. Right, think of all the famous people. Uh, the, uh, Heath Ledger, Whitney Houston, right? All of these people, they died at a hotel. Why? Why hotel? Lonely. What was that? Lonely. Lonely. Actually, the majority of people who actually die from overdose from a drug don't take more drugs than they've taken before. It's actually a misnomer. Most people think, and if you think about it, why is someone going to go to a hotel, someone famous, and say, let me take more drugs? Right? They don't necessarily die from taking more drugs. Because one of the things that we know is your brain is an amazing, amazing machine. Right? And your brain, what it wants to do is it always wants to stay at something called homeostasis, right? Your brain, kind of like body temperature, right? Your body will do everything it can to adjust. It'll make you sweat. It'll do anything to keep you at that same body temperature. And the same thing with drugs. Any drug works on a chemical called dopamine. And your body will adjust and change to go ahead and keep you at that level. I'm just gonna make up some numbers, right? These are not actual real numbers. But let's say, for example, your body makes 50 units of dopamine, right? If you get to 90, you're dead, good? So let's say I just go to my basement, right? And I, let's say, take uh, cocaine, for example. So let's say I now get an extra 10 units of dopamine. So I go from 50 to 60. Remember, 90 kills me, good? But let's say I keep doing this, right? So, my brain starts becoming really smart. It says, hey, every time I see that basement, I know I'm about to get dopamine. dopamine. I'm about to get drugs. Mm -hmm. So let's say the next time what happens is you go down to your, the basement, your brain says, ooh, I'm about to get some drugs. So it lowers that amount to, let's say, 40. So you now take the amount that you've taken before, which is 10 units. So now you're back at 50. You no longer have that high. So now you have to what? Right. Take more drugs. One of the reasons why you get tall. There's several reasons, okay? So let's say the person keeps doing this. Your body's gonna lower it, right? So let's say you get to the point where you go to the basement, right? And then your body lowers it to 20 from 50, good? You shoot up, 50, good? Now you're at seven, so the math, math is a challenge, right? <laughs> All right, so now you're at seven, good? So notice how much did the person shoot up? 50 units, good? So let's say the next day, person's back to 50. The person goes ahead and says, someone calls him to his, his friend calls him over and says, why don't you come do drugs at my place? So the person goes to his friend's place. What's his brain at? 50. He's gonna take the same amount that he's taken before, which is 50. Now he's at 100, he's dead. Even though he's taken the same amount. This is why a lot of times, and this is the thing, a lot of times I talk to youth and they say, I know my limits. Drug addiction has nothing to do with how good of a person you are, how holy, how moral. It is 
changes in the brain, right? You can be a, a, and I see it actually affecting the people that are the smartest a lot. Because they are so smart, they say, I get straight A's. But they think, because they're smart, they know where, right, how much I can, I know where I'm gonna go ahead and become an addict, when I'm not, has nothing to do with it, right? Um, it has a lot to do with, a lot of things, right? With your genes, right? You can have the exact, two people take the exact same amount of alcohol, or shoot up once. One will become an addict, the other one won't. Depends a lot of times on the genes, the genes you have, right? Uh, I'm gonna cover this, uh, I'm gonna skip some of this. I covered this one, right? Um, all right, I might get into a little bit too much detail, but so I'll go through this real quick, right? And I like presenting this because it really does show that addiction has nothing to do with how good of a person you are, whether you control it, right? All of the drugs in your brain, right, or all of the drugs take, um, take advantage of this pathway called pathway that pretty much goes to your frontal cortex, right? And as David said, when does that stop developing? 25 billion. What was that? 25 billion. Yeah. Um, the latest numbers that I've seen is that 90% of addicts started when they were young. So if you can just even postpone, <laughs> right, that you've got a less likelihood of them becoming addict, right? Um, just to give you some data, right? The thing that you can do in your body, right, that increases the most amount, so what dopamine pretty much tells you to do is to do a behavior over and over. It tells you that this is important, right? And it allows you to do it over and over. So, there are two things that they've seen that in your body, that you, or that you can naturally do to go ahead and increase dopamine, right? The two highest are food and sex. Okay, and that raises about 100 units of dopamine. So 100 units of dopamine is the most that you can physiologically, naturally do. Okay, look at some of these drugs. 100 units is the max, right? Look at meth, over 1,100. So these drugs literally hijack, you know, hijack your brain. Okay, um, here's something, going back to this, so there's certain parts of your brain that, as I, was I was, as I was mentioning, that have this memory that these certain events, these certain places, are associated with what? Drug. And then your brain will do what? The opposite of what? The drug will do. So let's say, for example, you are a heroin addict a heroin addict, and you decide, I never, I'm gonna stop doing heroin, good? And so you decide to stop, right? So let's say a month later, two months later, you're at your, you're at the nurse's office. She pulls out a syringe. syringe. Your brain sees syringe, knows that it's about to get, or thinks it's about to get, reward. a reward, so it's gonna naturally, what, reduce dopamine levels and you get this almost intense craving that you can't mm -hmm. control. There's a lot of times why you'll notice people do really, really well at rehab centers, they do perfectly fine, and then once they go back home, they relapse, even though they were doing good for what? Three months. Because their brain still remembers those things. And the thing is, you don't know what your brain has associated with certain drugs, <laughs> right? Okay. And so, Right, they've, for example, they've shown these, these, this was a study where they showed these um, cocaine users who were, um, who had uh, been clean for a while, right? They showed them videos that had to do with nature and stuff like that, and all of a sudden they showed them little pieces of clips of someone doing cocaine, or just pictures. And then all of a sudden, certain parts of that brain lit up. Right. And then, what ends up happening is your brain starts right, anticipating that drug, and so you get these strong cravings. I know of a person who uh, for 17 years was clean. Right? 
he happened to just bump into randomly into a friend who he used to do drugs with. That night, he relapsed, even though it was, what, 17 years. But your brain remembers these things very, very vividly. So even though, right, and he didn't know why, but it's all, it's because your brain remembers these things. That's why it's really, really, really tough to go ahead and, right, sometimes break these addictions, right? Same thing, you're an alcoholic, right? Okay, you've decided to stop. Your friend, you go to your friend's place, offers you a cup of orange juice, he opens the cupboard, you see a wine glass. Your brain automatically sees that wine glass, thinks it's gonna get drugs, it lowers it, you get this crazy. Right? Um, all right, so that's the, the other thing, right? This is what I like telling people. Because a lot of times people will tell me, right, um, I will go ahead and dabble in drugs, but I will never get to the point of addiction. That's the first mistake. You never know. It's your genes. You don't logically control these things. Okay? And then the other thing is, because what your brain does, is your brain does the opposite of what the drug does. So for example, I told you how all drugs increase dopamine. So what your brain does is in response to that drug, your brain will actually start killing off some of the receptors and it'll stop producing dopamine. So now when you're off the drug, you no longer have that natural feel good. So and this goes with marijuana, whatever, right? I no, have people- It never comes back, right? It never comes back, right? Your brain can recover, right? And this is, same thing is, uh, they've seen scare tactics don't work, right? Your brain can recover, but it never recovers 100%. I've had people, right, uh, because at my school people usually know that, uh, that I cover this stuff, so I've had a lot of people that will come in, right? Um, one semester I had three girls come into my office, right, and then they were all literally crying and they were telling me I'm addicted to marijuana, right? Help me to stop, right? And they were saying, when I'm off of it, I feel like I'll go do things with my friends. I'll go to you know Magic Mountain. I'll go to Disneyland. But I no longer have that natural what high. Like things that normally should make me feel good, no longer what make me feel good. What's wrong with you? Well, the problem is right, and this is true with any drug, right? Okay, with marijuana, whatever, right? Your brain will always do the opposite of the drug. So it starts killing off those neurons slowly it starts producing less of it. So what ends up happening is now when you're not on it, you no longer feel good. This is why I tell people, regardless of whether you think you're not gonna become an addict, it's not like you try something, you are literally messing with your brain. Okay. Um, this is why, same thing, going back to like the, mar the marijuana, right? I don't know, there was a, video that kind of went viral, which is the double rainbow video. There's like two rainbows. And the people are like, they're almost crying. Like, wow, this is the greatest thing. What does it mean? God is like, you know, they're so mesmerized, right? Because what, there's certain receptors in your brain that trigger this natural high, this natural, wow, this is something new I've never even experienced. But what happens is when you overstimulate that with the marijuana, what does your brain do? gets rid of it. Another misconception, right? Because I've had people, for example, will tell me this. They will tell me, um, David mentioned how it messes with learning and memory, right? I've had people will tell me, I've been on marijuana for a year, and I'm at the top of my medical school. So, right, what do you have to say about that? You're telling me marijuana messes with your brain. Here's the thing also that we know about the brain. Just because you don't show any symptoms does not necessarily mean nothing is happening. So for example, you guys know um, Parkinson's disease? Right, where you start to. There's a certain part of that brain that gets damaged that causes Parkinson's disease. Someone take a guess about how much of that structure has to be damaged before you just show 
very, very slight symptoms where you probably don't even notice. Eighty percent has to be damaged wow. before you should you show symptoms, because your brain is always trying to compensate. Same thing, Alzheimer's disease. Let's say I start showing symptoms of Alzheimer's disease today. If I had actually been taking an MR fMRI scan of my brain every day, I would have actually started noticing abnormal changes twenty years ago. It's not like Alzheimer's hits and then you lose your memory. It hits when your brain has been so damaged that it can't compensate. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times people will tell me, you know, I'm doing great and I smoke every single day. That one has nothing to do. You can be smoking, that does not necessarily mean something is not going well. Um, another interesting fact about marijuana. Um, if you take, for example, meth today and you wait five days, your urine analysis will pass to show that nothing has is in your system. If I take marijuana today and you want to take a guess how long it'll stay in your system, at least for a UA test at home, at least a month. Sometimes it'll stay in your system three months. A lot of times people will tell me, look, I've gone five days and I don't have any withdrawal effects. Right? So that must mean I am not addicted. Marijuana is a unique drug. It's actually still in your system. That's why you don't feel about the withdrawal effects. Um, okay. The other thing, right, is that so you have that pathway that I said that helps you do something over and, and um, all drugs pretty much kind of um, abuse this. There's this other pathway that goes from your frontal lobe back to these systems that pretty much tell a person to stop doing the drug. Okay. Well, pretty much what happens, right, in your brain, right, this pathway that tells you to do something over and over gets stronger, that's what drugs do, they hijack the system, and they pretty much, this pathway that tells you to stop doing something gets damaged. And this is where, right, that frontal cortex, that's where it stops, or sorry, that's where we said um, develops later. So notice, this is one of the reasons why if you wait until later, you have less of a chance of becoming an addict. One, because the system has already developed. When you take a drug, the system is not developed and you're already hindering it, okay? That's why you, tell, you have people saying this, right? Towards the end, right? drug addiction, behavioral addiction, same thing. Towards the end of my crazy gambling, I remember playing at two in the morning just wishing I could hurry up and lose and go home because I couldn't stop if I had any money left. I actually get angry if I won because that meant I'd have to stay longer. <laughs> Notice the, the person doesn't want to be there. Right? It's almost as if that self-will part has been removed. Right? Okay. Um, right. We covered this, so I'm just going to go finish up with this part that I want to show. A lot of reasons why we get the tolerance. Okay? Um, <clears throat> yes. But this is pretty much what drugs do. Right? Is Right? Let's say a drug goes ahead and causes a certain amount of, these are neurons in your brain, that go ahead and cause, let's say, a person to get high. Right? So your brain does the opposite of what the drug will do. It'll go ahead and get, get rid of the receptors, right? do all of these things so that your brain, um, that your brain um, no longer causes pretty much uh, causes your uh, cells to fire. And it does the opposite. If a neuron, if a drug causes too little, right, it'll put in more receptors. So I just wanted to cover a little bit about as far as what kind of the drugs do to your brain. If you have specific questions at the end as far as specific drugs, then I can cover those. Is there any uh, studies with the, the, the amount of THC now and yeah. some of those things that we were discussing? Um, is there any studies of now, what it, how that's affecting the brain long term? Sure, so there are long term effects and they have seen, so here's, as a scientist, I also never like talking about marijuana because here's the thing that the media will play on your lack of knowledge of, there's two main components within marijuana. There's the THC, like David, and then there's the CBD. Uh, David also mentioned that. What they found is most of the medicinal effects that marijuana has mm -hmm. 
is the CBD. Which doesn't make how Which how doesn't give you that, it, yeah, it's the THC that has the most. Yeah. So for example, I've got this several, uh, several research articles and videos where for example, there was this um, six, uh, sorry, I think it was a four or five year old girl, right? She had seizures, they were trying to do everything to go ahead and give her all types of medication, nothing helped. So the parents had heard that marijuana helps with seizures. Obviously they didn't want to give her marijuana, get her high. So they found a rare breeder who was actually going to throw away his plants because like David said, most mar what people have done is bred up the THC to get, to get it more addictive. So this, this group bred down the THC and bred up the CBD. So it pretty much had no THC and all CBD. So they gave the girl the spore, which almost does not exist in any uh, right dispensary because no one wants it. They, people want the high. So it pretty much cured her seizures. What did the media report? Marijuana, Marijuana cures seizures. If you look, right, this is why I never look at like CNN or all of these studies, because they'll say marijuana does this, marijuana is healthy. Usually when I look at those studies and I look at the actual journal from it, what they've used is the CBD, not the THC. Mm. And when it looks at what are the harmful effects, that's where they've used THC. And, but a lot of times the media will play on that and say, look, meta, meta, there's so much, and I do tell people, people get shocked. Like David said, their marijuana is helpful for certain things. But usually it's not the marijuana that's sold out there. It's usually the CBD. So big difference on on the two. So the big thing is, you know, uh, so we're dealing with people that have addiction. And obviously, sometimes when you try to take somebody who has an addiction to marijuana, and they want to get help, and they want to overcome, sometimes even inpatient rehabs, you know, lack. Yeah. Yeah. Or versus just absolutely there's nothing on the marijuana, nothing on where do we start? Sure. So usually if, one, if they are not convinced that marijuana has, uh, I personally, right, and it depends on who I'm talking to, I show them research, right? I tell them, let's be unbiased. You do your research and I will do my research. Now, if you're going to do that, right, I'm going to give you scientific journals. You don't go to www.marijuanaisfoolforyou.com and then come up with things. So far, I have never lost one argument with someone who says, oh, I told you, that's fine. You do your research, I'll do my research. But we're going to agree that we're going to use scientific journals. Because media is very biased and they're not scientific people. And I tell them, then let's go ahead and, do, and come up. You do your research. And usually what I've come up with is I haven't found much. Because when they do find uh, marijuana is helpful for this, they go to the article, what did they use? CBD. That's one. When it comes to people that are looking for help, and the other thing that I ask them is, well, if marijuana is not addictive, when are you telling me that the, the people, the students who have I personally dealt with, who have come to me, who have told me I'm addicted, help me, are you telling me that they're making this stuff up in their head? And then you guys know that there's MA, you know AA? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. You know that there's MA now. Marijuana. Yes, there is MA out there. Mm -hmm. So, why are people going to it if it's not addictive? So when you've got a whole bunch of things that are in front of your face, it's hard, right? Um, it's hard to deny. When it comes to helping people, right, I think one of the things that we oftentimes do is we tell people when they do relapse, right, we get harsh on them. And I think that's not the right way. Because right? if you think about it, sometimes they're hitting themselves already on the head because they relapsed. The best thing to do is I usually tell them, right, okay, you went three months without doing it. That's awesome. I reinforce the fact that they went they say, okay, you stop now, and you try to like, you try to go for four months, you try to go for five months, you try to go, right? Because they've, one, they're already upset at themselves, and probably from their family, their friends, they're already gonna hear a whole bunch of negative, negative comments. They don't need that. They need more of the, that positive reinforcement, that positive, you can do this, right? And 
yeah, you relapse. And the truth is, I don't think I know that many people who just came out of addiction like completely. Most people, right, the data show, will relapse several times before they, mm -hmm. before they come clean. And if you're that person that says, hey, the fact that you relapse is normal, right, then that gives them encouragement to say, versus now they've become, they're in despair. Well, I, I tried and I gave up, so what's the point? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add something to, 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 to what you were saying. Um, one of the things I, I've mentioned to people before we went through this, um, the idea that when people say, oh, marijuana is not addictive, is an interesting theoretical idea, right? It's, 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 science doesn't bear it out, but uh, I'll ask them, well, tell me, about your, tell me about your life. Tell me about your daily life. One of the, the first thing they'll hear if they go to AA, step one is, we've come to recognize that our lives have become unmanageable, right? Um, the, um, the, the experience of my life is not the way I want it to be going. I can't stop what I'm doing and it's affecting my life negatively when you begin to have that experience. That's when they could say all day they want that marijuana is not addictive for anybody else if they wanted to. But they know the concrete experience now is my marijuana or heroin or pornography or whatever it might be is affecting my life this way. I'm, I'm having the hardest time with people who are professionals mm -hmm. and working years and have been smoking for years and have families and it's their little glass of wine at the end of the night or beer. This is the hardest thing for me. And, and, and great people and smart and can keep it together and it's just. That's why I always like going back to that, that example of all of those diseases. They're, the majority of neurological diseases, right, you don't see the, the symptoms until much later. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there's brain cancer, that there is damage happening is there, is there a way to measure that? Like, can they get scans in the brain and say, well, you damaged this much already? With, not not that I know of with, with uh, marijuana. marijuana. Yeah. 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 As much as I like the presentations, and it's also impressive, and I'm all, I'm lost. As far as? Well, I'm here, I'm here. Oh, like how, here. Do, how do, how do we, why are we here? So. How do we I know, that's, that's, that's her. That was my point. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I'm, that's why I'm safe to the last part. <laughs> 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 I see the discussion, I see the discussion, and you guys can go on the discussion. We can be like listening to you all day. And this is overwhelming, and this is very good. But then, okay, I think, uh, I'm not sure, I'm not looking in the back, so I don't know who's behind me. So forgive me, everybody in the back, okay? I'm not sure why you're here. <laughs> no, let's see right now. But this is the question, the, the, Why do we hear? Okay, we we, uh, we hear this. Where do we go? Okay. Maybe there's a bigger plan. Maybe there's. There is a bigger plan. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Thank you. Give me my shot. So. Thank you for the segue. Introducing uh, Monica now. The segue is uh, why are we here? So, uh, Monica has been serving with uh, our free indeed. It's called Free Indeed Recovery Ministry, and, and it you know, uh, gives us the understanding of, from the, the verse that the Lord said, if the Son has set you free, then you shall be free indeed. Obviously, there is a lot of work with that, and, and it takes uh, a, a lot of a huge team to try to get uh, efforts together so we can help somebody. Uh, but I'll give you a little bit of intro to Monica Mpheel. She's a licensed MFT, married family therapist, who worked in the community mental health field for seven years and currently works at the Child and Family Division at D.D. Hirsch, very well-respected clinic, mental health services. So we we'll give our attention to Monica. And a little bit of the work she's been doing with the diocese. Yeah, um, so I primarily work with child and family at Community Mental Health. So I do deal with teenagers who do use substances and also struggle with mental health issues. And so I also teach high school kids in, in my church, and I'm actually very well involved with our youth. And so we have all this great wealth of knowledge and all these great resources, but then what do we do with that? Like, where do we come into the picture? And so, you know, a lot of the times when we talk about these things in our own churches, it's taboo, it's um, attached to shame, guilt, embarrassment. No one is ever forthcoming about their substance use, their mental health issues. So it's really important to kind of like, so then what do we do? How do we approach people in our community? How do we get them the help they need? Right, and so there's three things that I think about. It's education, which is 
what uh, David and Michael did is education, educating our, uh, our parents, our youth, our congregation, and also, aside from education, is support. You know, how do we um, build a relationship with our congregation, our, you know, the person next to me, my Sunday school kids, you know, all these people are struggling in so many ways. So aside from the education piece, we need to offer support. We need to raise awareness. We need to start talking about it from clergies to Sunday school to just being me and being a caring, curious, loving Christian who wants to help my neighbor. Um, so that and encouraging them to seek help. And I told you, but like, my vision is for having like a liaison at every church or county that if a priest encounters someone from their congregation saying, I'm in need of help, I'm struggling with these issues, they can appoint someone to refer them to resources, you know, get an information about, you know, do they have insurance, do they have Medi-Cal, do they need low-cost services? So I, so I put a presentation together um, to talk about substance use and education, educating not just the youth but parents understanding how that affects them, which was something that you guys talked about. I'm not going to repeat any of that. Um, so like the substance use, the, the um, you know, how it affects obviously the brain and our development. Um, so the Department of Mental Health starts screening drug, uh, drugs, drugs with kids who are 12 years old. So they start at 12 years. So all my clients 12 years old and older, I, as silly as it sounds, I have to drug test them and drug screen them if they're taking any sort of substances. Um, so, and there's lots of research that show that between the age 20, let me see. So 23.5 million people age 12 or older needed treatment for an illicit drug or alcohol abuse problem. And so from, and then they did research that only 2.6 million of those people got the treatment that they needed for their substance use. And by 12 and 13, it's actually not just exposure and not just use, but they're actually abusing drugs. So you could only imagine that even before that, there are also some exposure and some use in younger children. Um, and, and you know, we could have the gene for it. You know, our gene is our blueprint, and our experience is what shapes us. So um, in terms of that, like, what can we do? So me and Marian Nashid, who's also in the psychological clinic, and we both went out to the basketball coach meeting, and we talked to, to the coaches not just, oh, here are the signs for substance use, here's what to look out for, that's all great, but the moral of the story is, you know, you're not gonna grab a kid and say, hey, you know, I've noticed you, you know, these are the symptoms that I'm noticing, are you using substances, let me get you help. That is not the way we engage our youth, we engage our kids to seek help, or anyone, really. We come from a curious place. Hey, I've noticed this about you. I've noticed that you're struggling, you're having these challenges. Let's talk about it. I wanna get you help, right? So we talked about ways they can engage with the youth. And I'm not talking about just basketball coaches, but Sunday school teachers, including some uh, form of lesson on peer pressure, on substance use, and being able to be okay and address the topic with clergies and priests to include mental health and substance use and all that stuff in their sermons to say this is, this is a topic that we need to address. We need to normalize that we all experience challenges and difficulties in life, and sometimes you know, some people resort to substance use in a way to cope with their suffering, a way to cope with what they're dealing with, these life stressors. So when, when they get help, when they get support, they can better cope and manage and regulate their feelings instead of resorting to substance use. And that's why Free Indeed is um, coming up with a recovery program to help with that. So with that being said, um, I think it's really important that we come up with ideas. We wanna hear from you how we can approach our community. What can we do to talk about it, to address the issue, to make it more comfortable? There's no, there's a huge stigma behind it. You know, there's huge taboos. You know, no one, like I said, is ever forthcoming. So what do we do? How do we approach people? How do we talk to people? So I, I come up with a presentation that talks about substance use and mental health, and I incorporated the Free Indeed um, recovery program what that looks like and how people can get help and if they were to get help, what would that look like? So yes, they go to this residential rehab program, but it doesn't end there because it's important when they come out of there, they also have to continue to be linked up to other outpatient services and support. That's huge and like, you know, of course it's hard for them not to relapse, so there's gonna be setbacks, but we need to as a community, as a congregation to help them and ensure that they're gonna have a successful recovery.
Um, so I can't really show you the uh, presentation, but a lot of it is what David had talked about in terms of how, how do we approach our youth, how do we approach our parents, communication is key with our parents, um, letting people know that they are not alone and that there is help and help exists out there. You know, and it's, it's just to normalize it for them. For parents is to have, we did a parenting workshop at St. Mark's. I was a part of that with, um, with someone who used to work at Cedar sinai who uh, did Triple P program, parent, positive parenting program. And we developed this, you know, based off that model, we developed a program for parenting a workshop introducing how to communicate with your kids, how to monitor them, how to talk about these really sticky situations and how do we approach them. So I'm hoping that we develop programs, you know, if any of you guys have background in psychology or social work or any of these things, your referrals, your resources, your education really can play a huge part in this. Um, so, and then I also have a slide with all the counties and all the counties resources, not every resource, but I provided some resources in terms of mental health, substance use, suicide prevention, and all these things. It's on my PowerPoint. I can show it to you. Oh, you're gonna show it to you? I mean, I, 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 I can send it to you guys too. There's a lot out there. Of course. It's, yeah, it's just a, it's a little PowerPoint. It has just an idea of, I actually do need a USB. 